Thank you very much. This is a photo of my wife, uh, Jill. Jill, are you out there? Would you like to give a shout out? Yeah, there she is. See, I was using my neocortex this morning when I thought I could gain some uh, major brownie points with my wife at TEDx. <laughs> My wife is standing next to her grandmother, Hattie, who is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Hattie has this expression on her face that's very typical of Alzheimer's patients and typical of the patients that I saw when I was studying medicine at LA County Hospital and USC Keck School of Medicine. I'd seen this expression also in another place in the images of the self-portraits of William Udermullen, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1996 and who documented the progression of his disease. These images were very, very powerful to me uh, because they gave me the insight into the mind of a declining brain. And these were, in part, some of the images that inspired me to pursue uh, treating, new, or treating diseases with new therapeutics. Another trend I noticed in medical school that inspired me to pursue this was this, that over the past several decades, we've become much better at treating a variety of diseases, including cancers, uh, cardiovascular diseases and infectious diseases, but we haven't made the same strides in learning how to better treat uh, neurological diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease. This is very alarming, especially as the population ages. Uh, to give perspective, $200 billion was roughly 5% of the 2012 federal budget, and as the population continues to increase, these costs are only going to rise. What makes neurological diseases so difficult to treat? Well, traditionally we've used small molecules to tackle these diseases, and while they have served their purpose, I know we can do better. My advisor and I believe that larger molecules will be the future of therapeutics because they contain more chemical information and they can more specifically attack a disease. There's one issue with both small and mar large molecules, and that is that most of them have difficulty accessing the brain. That is, they won't be able to treat brain diseases, not because they lack functionality, but just because they can't get there. The one entity that keeps these molecules from entering the brain is the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier literally is a barrier between the blood and the brain. It is very good at keeping almost everything from accessing the brain. There are certain small molecules, such as some specific proteins that the brain needs to function correctly, that do access the brain by attaching to receptors, which are transported across the barrier and subsequently released into the brain. The focus of my work is to take these proteins and to put them on nanoparticles, and then we can put in thousands of molecules of drugs into these nanoparticles for the treatment of brain diseases. In essence, the proteins on the surface of these nanoparticles can attach to receptors on the blood-brain barrier, which carry the nanoparticles across the barrier and subsequently release the nanoparticles into the brain. This strategy is really no different than the strategy the ancient Greeks took at their last siege of the city of Troy, the strategy of the Trojan horse. Over the last several years, I've begun to understand some of the design rules for efficiently delivering nanoparticles to the brain, such as this nanoparticle, which is currently en route. And I've learned that if nanoparticles are correctly designed, they can cross the blood-brain barrier and they can accumulate in the brain where they can treat some brain disease. If the nanoparticles are incorrectly designed, they remain almost exclusively in the vasculature, as you can see here. The main question is, how far-fetched is this? Is the strategy of developing new nanoparticles for the treatment of brain diseases? And I'm here today, today to say that it's not completely unreasonable. Since 2006, our lab has generated two nanoparticle therapeutics that are currently in clinical trials and have be, been shown to be safe and effective in the treatment of tumors. This is a photo of my advisor, Mark Davis. He's in the blue shirt, standing behind the first patient to ever be treated with our first nanoparticle therapeutic. He was treated for pancreatic cancer. Now that we're beginning to understand how to successfully deliver these nanoparticles into the brain, it's not unreasonable to say that we can generate the new generation of nanoparticle, a nanoparticle version 2.0, if you will, that's specifically designed to treat brain diseases. In conclusion, when I'm an old man, hopefully we'll be much better at treating brain diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, and hopefully I'll be able to recognize my grandchildren when I'm near the end of my life. Thank you very much.